Calvary Church is dedicated to doctrine, and we want you to experience the life change that comes from knowing God's Word and applying it to your life. So we explain the Bible verse by verse, every chapter, every book. This is Expound. We're in the book of 2 Corinthians. We are in chapter 10. Contrary to what most of you anticipated last week, I covered two chapters. Some said it couldn't be done. It was done. And uh, we, oh, you don't have to applaud for that. It's, it's the least I could do. So we are in chapter 10. So there was uh, this one congregation, and the church leadership confessed in this one congregation that it was having problem with a family in its church known as the Tate family. The Tates were giving them all sorts of grief, all sorts of problems. Um, there is old man Dick Tate. He wants to run everything while Uncle Roe Tate tries to change everything. Their sister, named Agitate, stirs up plenty of trouble with help from her husband, Irritate. Whenever there's new projects, Hesitate and his wife, Vegetate, want to wait around till next year. Then there's Aunt Imitate, who wants our church to be like all the other churches. Devastate provides the voice of doom, while Potentate wants to be a big shot. And of course, there's the black sheep of the family, Amputate, who has completely cut himself off from the church. I've met the Tates before. Every leader in any Christian endeavor, any pastor, every pastor has met at some point the Tate family. Um, That's okay. It just proves we are all human beings, sinners saved by grace, And that's what happens when you get a bunch of imperfect people together, right? Paul had problems as well. Paul started the church in Corinth. He was the founder. He laid the foundation, stayed there for 18 months, left and went on to Ephesus. But when he left, the church was pretty stable People took advantage of the fact that the founding pastor was gone and started stirring up trouble for the founding pastor. Even though Paul wasn't there, uh, Paul was on his way back. He said he would be back sooner. He wasn't. Now he is definitely coming back on his way from Macedonia, take up a collection, including the church of Corinth, on his way to Jerusalem. But With that in mind, he is addressing those dissenters, those people who have turned the church against Paul and caused him real grief. Now, again, you know this probably if you've been with us, and and my repetition will only reinforce the fact that you know it and you'll never forget it. But I mentioned to you, and I probably mentioned it over and over again, there were four basic reasons Paul wrote the letter. There were more, because more is included, but four basic reasons. First of all, he wanted to encourage the church to forgive and restore a brother who had sinned, probably the one who had committed incest in chapter 5 of 1 Corinthians, who has now repented, seen the error of his ways, wants to get back into fellowship. He writes to encourage them to receive a repentant brother back. And isn't it good news that no matter how far you have fallen from God, no matter how grievous the sin you have committed against the Lord and against the church is, you can be forgiven and brought back and restored. And Paul says, He suffered enough. Bring him back. Forgive him. That's reason number one. Reason number two is he wants to explain why he didn't show up when he said he was going to. To explain his delay. He had been in Ephesus. He uh, sent Titus over to Corinth. He was going to meet him in Troas. Didn't show up. Paul went on to Macedonia. It has been a long time. But Paul is on his way back to Achaia, that's the region, and to the church at Corinth. So he wants to encourage them to forgive. 
he wants to explain to them why he is delaying. Third, he wants to enlist their financial support. That's what last week was all about. Two chapters where Paul says, look, we started this a year ago. Now we're following through. Let's take up that offering for the poor saints in Judea. Reason number four, Paul wants to establish once and for all for this church in Corinth, wants to establish his own base of authority, his own apostolic calling, that he is an apostle. He did start that church. He did plant that church. And that as an apostle called by God, he comes with certain authority. Though he wants to be gracious, he, he wants to be kind, he wants to serve, he's ready if need be, to bite and uh, to give a spiritual smackdown to those people who are causing such grief and such trouble. And so to establish his own authority, he writes this letter. And that, that brings us right into chapter 10. As we are getting into this chapter, and as I mentioned what I've mentioned to you, I've told you this before, we have a tendency, do we not, to look back to the New Testament through, with rose-colored glasses and idealize the early church. Idealize it as if, oh, it was so much better than the, it is today. It, um, it is the perfect church. It was the perfect setting. It's what God intended. Just look at the New Testament church. I've heard this for years. Look, go back to the New Testament. That's what he intended. Well, yes, in the book of Acts, in the beginning, it was awesome. Awesomeness happened. And the epistles of Paul that bring correction to the church, all of those principles, that's filled with awesomeness. But we idealize the early church, the church in the first century, as, as if, you know, it's like the good old days. Oh, those were the good old days. The good old days is nothing more than a bad memory and a good imagination. That's the good old days. You're not remembering everything, and you're looking at it in an idealistic way. Case in point, Corinth. The church at Corinth. 1 Corinthians tells us they had problem after problem after problem. There, there was division among their leaders. Division among the flock about the leaders. There was a problem with immorality. There was a problem with marriage and illicit, uh, re, uh, illicit divorce and remarriage. There was a lack of love. There was an abuse of spiritual gifts. There were doctrinal problems concerning the resurrection. And that's just one church. That's one assembly. So someone gave this as an example or an illustration. The church, a true picture of the church, it's like we're a pack of porcupines on a cold, wintry night. We sense that we should get closer together because it is cold and body heat will help us share our warmth. And so we are very clever about adjusting our quills just so, so that they can sort of intermesh with each other. But then we get a little too close. And when we get too close, <gasps> ouch, right? So the author said we need each other, but we needle each other at the same time like a pack of porcupines getting too close. Or maybe here's a better analogy. It's like a family vacation. I have many memories of my family vacation growing up, many fond uh, memories. But four boys in the back of a Rambler station wagon from California to Minnesota did come with its share of problems and missteps, and mishaps, and bad memories as well. So both are true. Families dearly love each other. At the same time, it's tough. And so it is with any church family. So it was with Corinth, 
but Paul, as we see, is totally and completely committed. So we begin chapter 10, verse 1. Now I, Paul, and he's getting very personal again. Now I, Paul, myself, am pleading with you, begging you, entreating you, beseeching you, whatever word you want to use. I'm pleading with you by the meekness and gentleness of Christ, who, who in presence am lowly among you, but being absent am bold toward you. Now that last part of verse 1 is what those antagonists in Corinth were saying about Paul. That, those were their words. They were saying, in presence he is lowly among you, but being absent he is bold towards you. You know, when Paul's here privately, you know, he was so sweet. He started this church and he shared with us the love of Christ and he was so humble and so winsome. But then when he travels and he writes us letters, they're harsh. And he's bold and gets in your face with these letters. So, uh, you know, he talks big when he's far away, but when he's up close, you know, he just sort of rolls over. That's how the accusation was going against Paul. Now, the truth was, Paul was gentle with them. Paul was kind to them. Paul was humble in their presence. You know why? That's what good leaders do. Good leaders don't throw their weight around. Good leaders carry other people's weight, other people's burdens. How can I bear your burden, brother? That, that's what leaders do. Spiritual leaders bear people's burdens. They don't throw their weight around. But these people were in Corinth throwing their weight around and making accusations against Paul. Several years ago, and unfortunately it still lingers, but not so much so, gratefully, there was um, a teaching spreading through the American church, actually all around, I encountered it in several countries, a movement called the Shepherding Movement. The Shepherding Movement was basically discipleship in the extreme. I will be your shepherd. I will be your discipler. I am going to share with you God's will. You, therefore, must submit in everything to what I'm telling you. Your finances, who you should date or not date, what you should buy or not buy. And in many of these circles, they want to go by the name Apostle. I'm God's apostle, I'm his representative, and you need to submit to me. A good leader doesn't say, you need to submit to me. A good leader serves others and leads by example. Again, doesn't throw their weight around, but carries the burden, the weight of other people. So, as I mentioned, shepherding has sort of um, fallen by the wayside in many places, though uh, it's still around. Now, I understand that Part of the role of a shepherd, that, that is a pastor, I go by the name pastor, people sometimes call me Pastor Skip, one little girl called me Spaster Skip when she saw me, it was a slip of the tongue and her mom tried to correct her and I said, no, no, actually, that fits perfectly, I'll take it, Spaster Skip, so there you go, you got a new title for me. But the idea of a pastor does connote a shepherd, a sense of shepherding. And, and while I don't mind assuming the role of a shepherd, keep in mind, I'm just a sheep too. And we follow, in essence, the good shepherd over us all. I'm a shepherd in the sense that I'm an under-shepherd. I can direct and give you principles and pray with you, and I'd love to give you any kind of advice that I can. But I cannot be your shepherd and dictate every move that you're going to make. And sometimes I've had people tell me to do that. One gal come into, came into my office and said, I told the Lord before this counseling session that I'm dating this guy, and if Skip says I can marry him, I'll marry him. I said, I, I won't tell you if you can marry him. I will not oblige you on that. Well, you're my shepherd. Well, I'm an under-shepherd. 
But why on earth, when the Lord said, he will be your shepherd, if you can have the Lord as your shepherd, why would you want to settle for anything or anyone else? Especially me. Oh, but you need to tell me what I need to do. Listen, half the time, I don't know what I should do. So, Paul did have authority and is willing to use the authority if need be, but that was not his style nor approach. So, now, I, Paul, myself, am pleading with you. The word Paul, by the way, the the name Paul, means little. Little. And uh, he was little in his own estimation. Sometimes people in the shepherding movement were much bigger in their estimation than they should have been. So I like that Paul uses his name here and says, Now I, Paul, myself. And and I love this part. I am pleading with you by the meekness and gentleness of Christ. Now here's why I like it. This is very rare for Paul. This is just an FYI. Normally... When Paul refers to Jesus Christ, he refers to Christ in his glorified, exalted status and position of power as God the Son. Every now and then, but very rarely, does Paul refer to Jesus in his earthly status. And this is one of the places. I beseech you, or I implore you, or I beg you, I'm pleading with you by the meekness and gentleness of Christ. In the Gospel of Matthew, Jesus said, I am meek and lowly in heart, and you will find rest to your souls. He said that about himself, and he proved that character trait over and over again. And so referring here to that earthly characteristic of Jesus as a leader who had meekness, he comes and approaches them, and he says, concerning what they are saying, who in presence am lowly among you, but being absent am bold toward you. So he's approaching them in meekness. Now he's going to say, I'm ready to rough up those dissenters, but I'm coming to you in meekness. Now let me just explain to you briefly, I don't want to take up too much time because I really do want to get through this chapter. And uh, I know you're saying, Skip, you, you have a tendency to do this, but you'll forgive me. Um, Meekness is not weakness. Though many of us think of the attribute of meekness as weakness. We think of a meek person as sort of being uh, Casper Milktoast. He's uh, spineless, you know, doesn't really put his foot down. That's not meekness. That's weakness. The word meekness, praos in Greek, means literally power under control. That term, the Greek term praos, was used of a horse, a wild stallion who had been broken by a trainer and was now useful and rideable. Very powerful creature, but now under the control of the trainer, under the control of the master. So a meek person is a powerful person who's under God's control. And when you get a powerful individual, but who is under God's control, that's a great asset to the body of Christ, a great need in all areas of life. So the meekness of of Jesus Christ, I, I uh, and pleading with you in the meekness and the gentleness of Christ. So a meek person, this includes Paul, is God's gentleman. And uh, a meek woman is God's sweetheart. I'm trying to think of an equivalent of gentleman. So can be powerful, can be um, assertive in personality. Nothing wrong with that if that's your personality, but under God's control. Power under control. And he says, but I beg you, verse 2, that when I am present, I may not be bold with that confidence by which I intend to be bold against some who think of us as if we walked according to the flesh. Throughout the book, Paul 
hints at this idea that, look, you guys, by the fact that you entertain these antagonists and these false apostles, you're forcing me to a position of being harsh. I don't want to be, but I'm ready to be harsh against some. I intend to be harsh against those, but I don't want to be that way toward you, the greater body of Christ. But I will against some who think of us as if we walked according to the flesh. For though, verse 3, for though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh. Yes, we live in our fleshly bodies. Yes, we are beset by trials and temptations of the old fallen nature, the flesh. All of us are. But when it comes to spiritual battles, spiritual warfare, we don't engage in anything but the spiritual realm. In spiritual warfare, Satan always seeks to move you to do battle in the flesh, to react, to get angry, to take things in your own hands. Instead of staying in the position of a spiritual person fighting it with spiritual weapons. And the reason he wants to move you in the realm of the flesh is because he knows if he gets you to flesh out that he's going to win every time. If he can't move you to the arena of the flesh, but you fight the battle using spiritual means, word of God, prayer, accountability, fellowship, etc., that he can't win, that he's done for. You will win if you keep the battle in the arena of the spirit, not in the flesh. Paul the Apostle said, we do not war with flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers in spiritual places. So because of that, we should fight it with not fleshly weapons, but spiritual weapons. In the book of Ephesians, Paul gives a list of the armor that we wear when we engage in spiritual battle. I put on the whole armor of God, I do it with the might that he gives you, and he lists the army, armor, armor, army, armor, uh, army in the ar armor in the army, a helmet of salvation, sword of the spirit, shield of faith, etc., um, having gird your waist with a, uh, the right belt, etc., praying always with all prayer and supplication in the spirit. One of your greatest weapons in a spiritual battle is prayer. When you pray, you're, you're gaining the advantage. You're bringing a gun to a knife fight. You're out there with knives. Suddenly you just say, wait a minute, God, now you've just outgunned the opponent. Because you're not using your own power, your own might. You're, you're calling on God. It, it really is decisive. You know, the Bible says that the angels desire to look into the things of the church. And I got to figure that some of the angels are scratching their heads when they look at the way we fight our spiritual battles. And they probably look at each other and go, why, why isn't Skip praying? Look at, he's on the phone, he's, he's uh, getting angry, he's shuffling his feet, he's trying to make these decisions. If he would just, why don't they pray? You know, I just think sometimes they, they marvel at what we don't do when it comes to spiritual warfare. So Paul doesn't want to fight these battles against them in the flesh, like I'll use um, crowd manipulation and crowd dynamics, and I know how to use my voice to get what I want and get their attention and all of that kind of stuff. He wants to fight it spiritually. Though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh, for, and here's the reason why, the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty in God for the pulling down of strongholds, casting down arguments and every high thing that exalts itself against 
the knowledge of God, bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ and being ready to punish all disobedience when your obedience is fulfilled. In verse 5, he talks about casting down arguments and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. My mind immediately goes to a few areas of our culture, our society, when I think of this verse. I think of universities. How difficult it is to be a student in a modern institution of higher learning. Given what they will go out of their way to promote and insist that you buy into and believe. Their arguments, their high-sounding philosophical, intellectual snobbery because you believe in the Bible. But they hold a science and a higher learning and we know better. I think of government institutions. Same thing. Very difficult to live out your Christian witness in these areas. The woke training that both of those areas and almost now every segment of society is pushing and forcing. A transgenderism, even though it's so contrary to any sense or scientific sense. These are institutions and a world apart from God. And yet... We can be casting down arguments and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. And you start by bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. Now, that's your thinking. It could also be their thinking. Your thought life. Aren't you glad I don't know your thought life? I'm glad you don't know mine. But that's where the battle is fought. That's where we must do battle. And it really does come to the ability to take thoughts that wander and go in areas that are bad and, and unhealthy and impure and immoral, bringing them back to the obedience of Christ. But also other people's thoughts. So in a conversation, don't be afraid to say, well, you know, you just mentioned that, but I don't necessarily hold to that view, and here's why. Sometimes when you challenge a person's thinking and you force them to really think it through, it can be very helpful. So don't be afraid to engage and don't be afraid to bring their thoughts into captivity, uh, if possible, to the obedience of Christ as well. And being ready, verse 6, to punish all disobedience when your obedience is fulfilled. Do you look at things according to the outward appearance? Now, I'm going to be sharing with you what I think he's referring to here. If anyone is convinced in himself that he is Christ's, let him again consider this in himself, that just as he is Christ's, even so we are Christ's. It could be that what Paul has in his thinking when he writes this is something he mentioned in 1 Corinthians chapter, I think, 1, at least 1 and 2, 1 or 2, where he said, uh, some will say, I'm of Paul, some say, I'm of Apollo, some will say, I'm of Cephas, some will say, I'm of Christ. You know, they, they kind of think, well, you follow human leaders, but we just follow Jesus. And it was that super holy group, perhaps, that he is thinking about here when he says, Hey, if you guys think you're in Christ or they say we're in of Christ, so are we. We're all on the same page. We're all under the same authority. We all belong to Jesus Christ. No one has an exclusive corner on the market. But notice this whole idea about the appearance. Do you look at things according to the outward appearance? You know what the answer to that is? Yes, we do. We do. We are by nature, as humans, appearance-oriented. We look at a person, we notice what they wear, we notice how they do their hair, we notice uh, 
how they talk, and we start assessing background, education, frame of reference, a coolness factor or not, whatever it might be, we start making judgments and sizing that person up. That's how we are. We look at the outward thing. We look at the outward appearance. We are appearance-oriented. You have mirrors in your home. I, I, can, I can almost probably say without exception, everyone here looks in a mirror. What are you doing? You're looking at your appearance. Now, when you look in the mirror, some of you are pleased. Most of us are not. Because the mirror is telling us truth. And at least it's telling us, listen, before you leave the house, there's a few things you can notice that you may want to just pay attention to. And so you do, because you buy into the fact that we do judge by outward appearance. When the prophet Samuel came to the house of Jesse and was looking for a king, he noticed the firstborn Eliab, and he was tall and handsome, and he looked, you know, Schwarzenegger-esque. He looked, this was kingly material. This was royal stuff. And he thought, surely the Lord's anointed is before me. God spoke to him and said, uh-uh, wrong one. For God does not see as man sees. Man looks at the outward appearance. God looks at the heart. Some were judging Paul by appearance, especially this group, and feeding that into the ears of the Corinthians. For even, verse 8, for even if I should boast somewhat more about our authority, and he did have apostolic authority. Goodness, he founded the church. He founded the church in Corinth. He founded most of the churches we know about, that we read about in our New Testaments. For even if I should boast somewhat more about our authority, which the Lord gave us for edification or to build you up and not for your destruction, I shall not be ashamed. I don't mind speaking about the authority that God gave me, lest I seem to terrify you by letters. If you want me to do it in person, rather than by letter, happy to do it, happy to oblige. You want me to come and express authority in person? I can do that. You know, they're saying, well, his letters are tough, but he's a wimp up close. He goes, well, I'm coming. I'm, I'm happy to, to take up that challenge. For his letters, they say, are weighty and powerful, but his bodily presence is weak and his speech contemptible. Man, poor Paul. He knew that they were gossiping this way, that people were talking about the way he looked. Oh, look at him. Now, what was, it, what was he referring to? Well, we can't be sure, but I, we can be almost sure, because he doesn't say exactly. You know, we have no description of what Paul looked like in the New Testament. For that matter, we don't have a description of what Jesus looked like. I'm glad. I'm glad. And uh, I'll tell you why I'm glad about Jesus on another time. But, but let me talk about Paul. There is a book, or was a book, it's an apocryphal book. That is, it's not a book that we would consider to be a scriptural uh, book of authority written by the Holy Spirit, a pen by any apostle. But it's an apocryphal book, extra-biblical book, known as the Acts of Paul and Thecla. And uh, in this particular piece of correspondence, there's an account of Paul's physical appearance. This is the only historical document of what Paul looked like. But if this is accurate, you will understand the meaning here. Paul, and I'm quoting, he was a man of little stature, thin-haired upon the head, crooked in the legs, of good state of body, with eyebrows joining, and nose somewhat hooked. So if this is accurate, he's a short, balding, bold-legged, 
unibrow with a hook nose. Some other accounts that I've read, though I can't substantiate them, say he had kind of a high voice. Can't substantiate that. But it continues on, it says, but he was full of grace, for sometimes he appeared like a man, and sometimes he had the face of an angel. So if that is accurate, now you understand when they say, for his letters they say are weighty and powerful, but his bodily presence is weak and his speech contemptible. I mean, the guy's a short little unibrow and, you know, I mean, come on. He's, he's not, there's nothing impressive about Paul. Even his speech is contemptible. I don't exactly know what they mean by that, but let me, let me venture a guess. Corinth, part of Achaia, was a Greek city. The Greeks placed a high level of importance on eloquence, golden-tongued oratory, the ability to move a crowd persuasively by one's words. And they had many examples of that, and they, they placed a, a high premium on that. And so, you know, here's Paul, this Jewish guy trained in Jerusalem from Tarsus, coming to Corinth, coming to Athens. They're not impressed with that. Now, that's not, not to say that he wasn't a gifted speaker. He was. He was very persuasive. Uh, in Acts chapter 9, it says that uh, he um, confounded the Jews that dwelt at Damascus and proved to them that Jesus was the Christ. That's powerful speech. If you can stand in a synagogue uh, filled with Jewish antagonists and be able to hold your ground and confound their arguments and prove that Jesus is their Messiah, you got to be pretty skilled. Also, when he is in Lystra, Acts chapter 14, they say, the gods have come down to us. So, um, he was a powerful, persuasive speaker, but he lacked the Greek refined eloquence that we are so fond of. That's probably what the reference is. His speech is contemptible. When Paul did go to Athens, by the way, he went to Mars Hill, the Areopagus. Down below the Mars Hill, but below the Areopagus, was the Agora, the marketplace. And I, I've stood on Mars Hill, I've stood on the Areopagus, and I've looked down toward the Agora, and I've imagined Paul sharing his faith there and there. And it says when he went down into the Agora, the marketplace, that he was having conversations with different people in the marketplace, and some of the Stoic philosophers, the Athenians, the Stoics and, and another group of philosophers, said, what is this babbler trying to say. And that term babbler is an interesting term. Spermalagos in Greek means a seed picker. A seed picker, one who picks up a little philosophy here, picks up a little nugget of knowledge there, picks up this, that, and, and then he kind of mixes it all up and spits it out. He's a, he's a babbler, a, a spermalagos, um, a seed picker. So, he didn't match up to the Greek um, level. So his letters, they say, are weighty and powerful, but his bodily presence is weak. His speech is contemptible. Let such a person consider this, that what we are in word by letters, when we are absent, such we will we be indeed when we are present. See, he's taking their challenge of, oh, really, I'm weak in person? Guess who's coming to dinner? Guess who's coming to your town? I am. Don't want to have to exercise authority. Well, if I need to. So it's really a warning to the false teachers, but also to the people who are entertaining those antagonists against Paul. Verse 12, for we dare not class ourselves or compare ourselves with those who commend themselves, but they measuring themselves 
by themselves and comparing themselves among themselves are not wise. Now, here's another attribute of human nature. We compare ourselves to ourselves. Well, how many likes did he get on Instagram? Oh, he got more likes than I did. What do I do? I got to get more likes than he or she. You know, and so now you can buy likes. How desperate is that? You can pay a fee to get fake likes on your Instagram account. What's that all about? Well, you're comparing yourself with other people and trying to look good in that arena of social media. Paul says, that's not wise. There's only one evaluation, truly one, that you should live under and should motivate your life. That is, what does God think of you? What does God think of you? Well, they think I'm cool. Yeah, but you know the truth. You know you, and God knows you. And you want to make sure you're commendable to God and that the self-comparison and the other's comparison uh, isn't something you live by. God measures differently than we measure. We find somebody who um, is in our arena, but then we start thinking, well, in this area, I'm better than they are. We do this all the time. It's not wise because God measures things and people differently. When in the book of Revelation, Jesus wrote seven letters to seven churches, Essentially, those little postcards were report cards, right? He said, I know your works. He starts evaluating them. So he gets to the church of Smyrna, and he says, I know your poverty, but you are rich. Yes, you know that you are poor. Everybody knows that you are poor. That's your reputation for being a, a poor church in a poor community. But my evaluation of you is you are rich. I know your poverty, but you are rich. God's measurement is so different. Then he gets to the church of Sardis. And he says to that church, he says, you have a name that you are alive, but you are dead. See the difference. They had a reputation to uphold, filled with life and awesomeness. God says, Jesus said, you're dead. That's my evaluation of you. So which is more important? The reputation they have of being alive or Jesus announcing, you're dead? What Jesus said. And, and, and moving on from what Jesus said. To another church, church of Thyatira. He says, you say I am rich, have become wealthy, and have need of nothing, when actually you're wretched, poor, miserable, blind, and naked. Wow. Totally different ways of measuring. So once again, for we dare not class ourselves or compare ourselves with those who commend themselves, but they measuring themselves by themselves and comparing themselves among themselves are not wise. We, however, will not boast beyond measure, but within the limits of the sphere which God appointed us, a sphere which especially includes you. For we are not overextending ourselves as though our authority did not extend to you. For it was to you that we came with the gospel of Christ, not boasting of things beyond measure, that is, in other men's labors, but having hope that as your faith is increased, we shall be greatly enlarged by you in our sphere. Paul knew what he was called to. Paul knew what God had assigned him to do. He was called an apostle to the Gentiles. And he fulfilled that role. Now, if, if it was up to Skip to assign Paul his role, I would not have assigned him role apostle to the Gentiles. 
Given what I know about Paul's background, he was a Hebrew of the Hebrews. He was a Pharisee. He was steeped in uh, the oral tradition, the oral law, studied under a famous rabbi, Gamaliel, in Jerusalem. I would have said, there's nobody better suited than Paul to be the apostle to the Jewish people, not the Gentiles. Let him address the Jewish people. And it was always Paul's heart. I want to go back to Jerusalem, man. Just give me a crack at him, Lord. Just give me a chance. I want to speak to my brothers. I know they'll listen. Well, they didn't listen. They threw dirt in the air and wanted to kill him and got him arrested. And he was taken under Roman occupation to Caesarea. But when God called Paul in Acts chapter 9, you know the story, on the road to Damascus, he gets knocked off his beast and he's blinded and he gets taken to Damascus. Ananias, a disciple of Jesus Christ, is sent to him and said, I want you to go find this guy, Saul of Tarsus. He's a chosen vessel of mine, listen, to bear my name before the Gentiles, kings, and the children of Israel. But notice the order. Gentiles, number one. Number two, kings. Number three, children of Israel. And Paul followed that outline. He principally became the apostle to the Gentile world. He went where churches were not, where the gospel was not, in some cases where Judaism wasn't all that powerful. In many cases it was, so we'd go into a synagogue, then there'd be a riot. Paul knew it was coming. It would be a riot. He'd get beat up, get thrown in jail, get thrown out of town. He just sort of, you know, rinse, repeat, rinse, repeat. Just kept doing it everywhere he went. But he established Gentile congregations. He was an apostle of the Gentiles. So he, he knew the parameters of his calling. He could talk to Jewish people. He did stand before kings, but principally he was an apostle to the Gentiles. So um, notice what he says about that, which God has appointed us, a sphere which especially includes you. You're a Gentile group in a Gentile city, Corinth. For we are not overextending ourselves as though our authority did not extend to you, for it was to you that we came with the gospel of Christ, were church planters sent to you Gentiles. Not boasting of things beyond measure, that is, in other men's labors. I love this about Paul. Paul was looking for a place where the gospel had not gone before, virgin territory, so to speak. He didn't want to build on another man's foundation. He uh, would look for, he wanted to go to Spain and wanted to go to Rome. He wanted to take the gospel as far uh, as Rome and then eventually Spain, he writes in Romans chapter 15. That was his goal. Whether he got to Spain or not, we're not sure. He did get to Rome, though he was a prisoner. He made it. But he wanted to extend the boundaries of the gospel as a missionary church planter. Wasn't looking for the, well, you know, I feel called to Maui. I'm not saying you can't be called to Maui, but I am suspect if you say you are, just immediately, I am. But when you say, now God called me to Espanola, now I'm listening. Or to I could list a number of places. I don't want to do that by risking to offend anyone. But, um, but when somebody says, I'm going to Corinth, it's like, really? Wow. Man, you must be called. Because Corinth is hard. Uh, it's immoral. They're very Greek and very erudite in their thinking and philosophy, but okay. But Paul, you know, wanted to go where no man had gone before. And... Um, and not, not build upon other men's labors. Now, not everybody's like that. There are cultists. There are false apostles. You know, here, here Paul leaves, right? He leaves Corinth, and this group immediately comes in. Why? Because there's a leadership vacuum. A strong leader like Paul is gone, so they, they want to come in and build upon what Paul started. And sometimes that's what cultists do. That's what uh, sometimes people 
plant churches that way. They want to get into a church or uh, use church people to announce their new church that is starting up a mile down the road. Now, why, would you, why don't you go to the lost and win the lost and do evangelism? Paul never wanted to build on another man's foundation. But these people in Corinth, these antagonists against Paul, I, I consider them like mistletoe. You know, mistletoe, you know, we make a big deal of it at Christmas and people kissing under the mistletoe. Oh, isn't it a nice decoration? No, it's not. It's a parasite. Mistletoe is a plant that lives off another life. It has no life of its own. It has no life in and of itself. It must affix itself to an organism and derive the life from that organism in order for it to stay alive. And spiritual parasites were in Corinth. But the tree was coming back to town. Verse 16, to preach the gospel, here's, here's his mission statement, to preach the gospel in the regions beyond you. Remember again, Rome, Spain, and not to boast in another man's sphere of accomplishment. But he who glories, let him glory in the Lord. As Paul said, to the Corinthians, I, in 1 Corinthians, I planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the increase. God gave the increase. I planted the church. Apollos came along and watered it, but God gave the increase. So I know my sphere of influence. I'm a church planter. I planted the church. Apollos knows his sphere of influence. He's a Bible teacher. He came along and supplemented. But Really, it's his church, and he's the one that gave the increase. The problem is when waterers want to take the credit for being the planters, and neither one wants to give God the glory for giving the increase. That's where the problem lies. So that's why he says in verse 17, But he who glories, let him glory in the Lord. Now, Paul is quoting, in that verse, Jeremiah chapter 9. He's free rendering Jeremiah chapter 9, verses 23, 24, right around there, where it says this. Let not the rich man glory in his riches, nor the mighty man glory in his might, nor the wise man glory in his wisdom. But let him that glories glory in this, that he understands and knows me that I am the Lord exercising loving kindness, judgment, and righteousness, for in these I delight, says the Lord. I love that verse, or those verses. Paul is pulling that out because it's a very famous text. He, as a Jewish person, would know that and, and brings that in here. If you're going to glory, point upward. Glory in the Lord. He's the one who started the church. He's the one who gave them breath, gave me breath, gave them opportunity, watered, etc. 4, verse 18, For not he who commends himself is approved, but whom the Lord commends. Now back to the church of Corinth. They were saying, I'm of Paul. I'm of Apollos, I'm of Cephas, Peter, I'm of Christ. They were taking sides like people do today, taking sides over radio preachers they like or now internet preachers they like. Oh, have you heard? Now you got to listen to this. And, and well, this guy says this. And they, they start making these, these um, non-existent divisions. Of, all of them are servants of Jesus. But trying to pit one against another and take sides as to who their uh, favorite is. Listen, I understand having a favorite teacher. It's good. It's okay. To a point. To a point. Um, when they become the measuring rod by which you fellowship with another person or consider another person to be spiritual or not, that's problematic. I see this tendency among Calvinists and Arminianists, those who, I'm of Jacobus Arminius, or I'm of John Calvin, and you know, Calvin said, and listen, 
I don't care what Calvin said. He's dead. I don't care what Arminius said. He's dead. I care what Jesus said. He's not dead. He's alive. And even the words that Paul said are living and active and sharper than a two-edged sword because it's inspired by the Holy Spirit. It is scripture. So in all that Corinth was doing, in all that we have a tendency to do, um, make the focus, not the messenger, but the message. See, here's the danger, and Paul experienced it. Apollos experienced it. Peter experienced it. When God begins to use you, other people will recognize that God is using you. And when they recognize that God is using you, they put you up on an imaginary pedestal. And if you are one who is being put on a pedestal, you have to work hard and should work hard at getting off the pedestal, breaking down the pedestal, because you know you're just a man or a woman like anybody else. So off with the pedestal. They, <laughs> oh, well, I just looked at the time, and I'm out of time. And there's always more to say. At least I, I examples come into my mind to do this, but next week. Let me close this way. God uses people. And God is looking for available people, like Bill said. Not people with necessarily great ability, but you'll find when there's availability, God gives you ability. When there's availability, God will, if there's a real calling, and a gifting from God, you'll find the ability is there. However, all the while that God is using you, you have the awareness, you are weak, you are weak, you are weak, you are limited, you are flawed. Good. Because Paul said, God has chosen the foolish things of this world to confound the wise, the weak things of the world to put to shame the mighty that no flesh should glory in his presence. God is confined to use, using human beings. These are the tools God has at his disposal. Now, we might say, poor God. But God has chosen us, the weak things of this world. Because when God uses people like us, foolish things, weak things, God gets more glory. When a skilled individual is confined to using poor tools, his ability shines forth, even in a greater capacity. A surgeon can perform an operation in a surgical suite with the latest technology and personnel, but for him to perform or her to perform that procedure on a mission field with a Swiss Army knife, that skill. For God to change the world through people like us, that's skill. That's awesome. That's why we look at the message, not the messenger. So no pedestals here, right? Just simple people that God uses. That's why, take heart. God not only wants to, but is going to use you to change the state of New Mexico. There's enough firepower in this room to change the state of New Mexico. Jesus took 12 disciples minus one, Judas, changed the world. Let's do it. For more resources from Calvary Church in Skip Heitzig, visit calvarynm.church. Thank you for joining us from this teaching in our series, Expound.